So today's a day of greatness. But my title is Sin Removed, Covenant Revealed. I, uh, I'm talking about covenant for the next couple of weeks. The covenant of God, the covenant between us and God. I want to talk about it a little bit in a deeper sense. And I want us to open our hearts and our eyes up completely for what Jesus has for us today. Amen? Romans 9, 1 to 5, I'm going to look at. Romans 9, 1 to 5. Now, I'm going to be reading Romans 9, 1 to 5, and um, Romans 11, 27 to 32. And the only reason I'm saying all that together is because I might just kind of put it in one big smorgasbord. And um, because th there's so much in those chapters, there's so much in there that it's so great. But one thing about grace, I was, you know, you look at grace and we th sing about grace and we talk about God's grace, and, and God's grace is so cool because it's part of God's covenant for us. And I was looking at grace a little bit. So grace is great, but if grace has to be worked for, it's not grace. But gr work without grace is not grace either. So it's kind of a, a mix-up for some people. So I was looking at it and I was thinking about it because these scriptures do talk about it. If you read the chapters, that is, it talks about how God's grace works in us. But if we have to work for our grace, then it's not grace no more. But if we have grace and we work, it's God's grace. Am I confusing anybody yet? And so I said, God, how does that work? He says, because when you have his grace, you do it out of grace. You don't do it out of work. You do it because you have grace to do it. You don't do it because you have work to do it. You don't do it for a duty no more. You do it because it's your grace that you're working in. It is not a place of work in you. So when you walk in your call and you start walking in who you are, and you start walking in the covenant of God, you start experiencing grace instead of the work. And the work gets done through grace instead of work through grace. Amen? So the grace works. So as soon as you accept God's grace, it flows through you and you start doing. And when you start doing God's work, I'm telling you, how many people say that sometimes you feel like you're doing duties, some days you could just work and work and work and it wouldn't matter to you. you could, uh, that's grace when you can do that. Grace is when you do stuff and it doesn't bother you. Grace is something that you have passion for. Grace is something that's within you that flows through you and you're going to do whatever it takes to flow in that grace. Me as a pastor... I can be here t all the time. It wouldn't bother me because there's God's grace in it. I could preach all day long. I could preach more than once a day if, I, if it, I, it was, uh, God's grace is in it. But now if I did something and I'm trying to do stuff I'm not called to do or stuff that I just don't have grace to do, man, that's hard work. You get where I'm going? When you walk in God's covenant, you start walking in peace. And when you start walking in God's covenant, you remove the things that are interrupting you and you start walking in the very thing that God has called you to be. And when you do that, there is some, you know, sacrifice and so forth involved, but there is a place of God's grace. So it's not grace if you have to work hard for it. Grace is given to you already so that you can work. So that you can do the work. Amen? I just thought I'd put that in for free there. <laughs> Since grace is free, I could do that for free. Romans 9, 1 to 5. Romans 9, 1 to 5. Boy, this feels odd in here today. I'm just have to, what do we do? Hallelujah. Let's pray for you. In Jesus' mighty name, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to be here again. Lord, I open the hearts, and we open our hearts to you, Lord, and your Holy Spirit right now to flow through us and to do amazing work in your kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I kind of know why people kind of shut down subconsciously. is because sin. The word sin is up there. <laughs> as soon as you talk about sin, everybody shuts down because they don't want to hear about it. That happens a lot of times. Sin removed. I remember, I'm not saying being sinful. I'm saying sin removed. And guess what? It's not even removed by you. So it's not a good thing that I'm going to be talking about. Sin removed. So pull from it. It's, I'm not going to come accusing. I'm not going to come across accusing. We're going to walk into what God has for us here today. Verse 1 of uh, Romans 9. I, this is Paul talking. I say the truth in Christ. I do not lie. I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. He's coming to the people here. He says, I'm telling you the truth in Christ. I do not lie. My conscience. 
my, my extinction between good and evil, my conscience, that what prompts me, what keeps me going, that conscience, the power of the Holy Spirit that's connected to, also bearing, which is a place of being witness and joint witnesses, is bearing with the Holy Spirit. And he says, I come in my conscience. That is not just my conscience alone, but it bears with the Holy Spirit. It bears and it connects and it's joined together with the Holy Spirit. I am joined together in the presence of the Holy Spirit to bring this forth to you today. And he says, Mike, I, I, lie, I tell you the truth. My conscience, I lie not. My conscience is bearing. How many of us want to grab a hold of that covenant power that we have where our conscience can connect to the Holy Spirit, where we can bear together, where we can be joined together as one? And I want to grab a hold of that today because that's a deeper level of a, of a covenant that you will ever have if you can choose to connect your conscience, your conscience to the Holy Spirit so you know that everything you do walks through and is joined together with the power of the Holy Spirit, that we walk together in it. Amen? I want us to grab a hold of that because I think that we often, he says, by, it's also bearing witness with the Holy Spirit. And so when we walk in the call of God, and when we walk in the grace of God, there has to be a bearing involved. There has to be something connecting. There has to be some witness connecting to walk forward in what he has called us to be or what the covenant we are designed to be with. Verse 2, that I have great heaviness and continue sorrow in my heart. This word that I have great heaviness, and that this thing, I have this continued heaviness in my heart, it means I have, I have this ceasing, I have this um, without ceasing in me, that I keep going and I'm fighting. I'm, even if I feel heavy, even though I am going forward in this, I have this heaviness that I have to come to you, and I'm going to continue to flow with this. Lord, we pray peace in those back rooms right now. <laughs> that I have great heaviness, continue sorrow in my heart. That continue means without, sorrow, without ceasing. Verse 3, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ. Accursed, that's a pretty interesting word, isn't it? I'm going to talk about that word a little bit. I need you guys to pull a little bit because I'm having a little bit of focus problem here because of the noise around me. So just pull a little harder. Stare at me if you have to. Do whatever it takes. There you go. That must have helped that prayer. <laughs> I guess I feel like Paul sometimes. When he says, I come with great heaviness and sorrow in my heart. And this Paul is coming to the brothers. He's coming to the fellowship. And he says, you know what? I have this heaviness for you guys. I have this heart for you guys. And, and I, I want to just see more of God in you guys. And he goes in verse 3, he says, For I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for you, my brethren, my kindred, my kinsmen, sorry, according to the flesh. Accursed means this. I wish that myself were accursed from Christ. This means this. A thing that is set or laid under to be kept. It is to be made a vow under something. It's resulting from a vow. It is being concentrated or being concentrated I'm think I'm saying that word right connected and blended together with Christ this word curse can be used in a negative term but we're using it in a positive term because it's King James Bible it's using the word curse it means that I I wish among all that I am so connected with Christ that I I confess I completely surrender and I choose to make that my being in a way if you want to say it in a in a non proper way that I have a curse against that I I something that I can't remove myself from I made a vow to Christ Jesus I made that I'm trying to bring this King James word out and I try to look at different translations a lot of translations use this word and so I couldn't find a perfect translation for myself that wouldn't use that word so I'm going to explain that word it's a place of connection. It's a place of, of saying that, hey, I myself were a curse from Christ for my brothers. For what reason do I want to be connected? For what reason should I be greatly uh, connected to? Uh, for what purpose should I do that? You know? And so we go into a place of being a curse. It's a place of connection, of the deepness of God in us. Amen? For my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, 
This kingsman is this, is a plain akin. Uh, the, I'm coming to you with my heaviness. I'm coming there with Christ Jesus. And I'm coming there because we, have the, we are related by blood. We're related by the blood of Christ Jesus. We're related in the presence of God. We are related to the very essence of who Jesus is. We are related. I'm coming to you because according to your flesh. And this word according to your flesh is talking about your human nature that has a divine influence. I'm coming to you because you and yourself has a divine influence for Christ Jesus. There's a divine thing happening in Christ Jesus. Amen? And so we go into this place of uh, Paul coming to as a leader, and, and he has this heaviness, and he's coming to this place. For what reason is he coming? He's coming because he has a concern, and he's coming because he wants to grab a hold of the brothers in Christ. Verse 4. Don't, don't look. Verse 4. Who are the Israelites? Who are the Tone of Morris? Who are the let go, let God measure? You can put your own name in there. Who, who are you in that place? To whom pertain the adoption of the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. And so here it goes. Verse 4. We are to pertain the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Like that's a whole mouthful there. And so we go on to this place of, he comes to the pertain, the adoption. We need to grab a hold of Jesus Christ for who we are in him. We have to be adopted to his glory. But his covenant is a place of, of who he is. It's a place of arrangement that he has for his children, the commitment that he made for his children, the commitment that he has made for the believers. He's made a commitment to us how to walk into this place. And he says, also, the giving of the law. And this is a place of less... <laughs> but anyway, the law. It's an act of making and acting laws. It means the body of law. So Jesus says this. This is what it means here. The covenants of giving the law. I am preparing a place. I am setting a place before you to be successful. I'm setting the restoration... Uh, the, the law. <laughs> we'll use the word law because that's working better for me. And we'll, we're, I'm setting you forth. It's by uh, enabling and acting something that was already placed before you. So how many know the blood of Jesus is before you? How many know Jesus Christ is before you? How many know the power of the Spirit is before you? It is a place of law that is set before you at this moment that is ready to be acted upon. So this is not talking about the law of the Old Testament. It's not talking about the law of the things that Jesus died for. This is talking about the law of the covenant. It's talking about the law of giving of the covenant of what Jesus already has placed before us, the commitment, the promises that he has set before us. He's setting a, a, an example. He's, he's putting an enactment together of how to live this out for us, how to be successful, how to be prosperous, how to be anointed, how to move forward in everything God has called us. This law is a spiritual law. This law is a place of giving you directions by the power of the Holy Spirit. I am already enacting. This word law means to enact something, meaning this. It's already it's like a, you have this Holy Spirit leading you, so it tells you exactly how to walk. Step this way, step that way, step. And you're, you know, have you ever played a, a racing car game where you could shadow yourself? And you're following this car where you're supposed to go? Well, that's kind of what this is. It's giving you a direction of law. It's giving you a direction on how to f drive through your life. And you can follow something. It's, a, it's giving you direction. It's giving you the law. Amen? And that's what the covenant does. It gives us a place. But it also gives us the service of God, which is the promises of God, which is the promises. Is, it's not just a promise, but it's an acting a promise. It means that I give you a promise that I want to act on. I'm not just saying something here with this covenant. I'm not just telling you something here, but I'm going to act upon my promises. How many of you are waiting for God to act upon his promises? Yeah. We, we, we need to act, hear, see it, the acting. We can't just hear about it. But I feel today's culture... We, we, we do the service of God and the promises of God, but we want to just hear the promises of God, but we don't know how to do the promises of God. There's too many times we don't know how to grab a hold of God's promises. We hear something. How many of you know when God says, when you, when you give, the windows of heaven will open? How do you grab that windows of heaven, that promise? When he says, if you sow, you will reap, how do you grab a hold of that reaping? How is that promise to released in your life? I, you, uh, people are saying, I give my time, I give my money, I give them this, all this. I do not see the blessing yet. I don't see the promise of God yet. Have you ever been there? Nobody's been there before? Okay. Yeah, okay. And so the promises of God is, is, is a place of acting the promises. It's a place of giving 
uh, it's a good blessing that comes your way. But when you look at the promises of God and you look at the covenant of God and you look at the harvest and sowing and reaping, that's why when she said it, that kind of goes well with what I was going to talk about today, is that when you actually sow something and then when you go harvest something, either it's 30-fold, 60-fold, or 100-fold. You know, you know 100-fold is full crop. That's what I believe. It's full blessing where it's designed to be. 30-fold is when you had 60% hail, maybe. Who knows? You had some kind of destruction in your life, but you still got blessing from your crop. 60-fold, you maybe only got 40% damage. 100-fold, you, you walk through the fullness of blessing of God. So it's not amounts. It's amount of fullness of your harvest, right? Would you agree? It's walking that harvest. Are, are, you guys, are you getting it? Okay, kind of. But anyway, kind of is good. You will get there all the way. And so when you get 30-fold... 60 fold because I just kind of was fresh in my head because I was farming a little bit this year and they said well that I have six percent damage well that's not too bad like we've got an average crop we got this much and so we go in that place but what I have found about the covenant of God and the promise of the God is that we create our own promises for God and we're trying to take a hold of those promises and I'm guilty of this just as well as anybody else is is that we do this okay I have this seeding I, I, I tithe I give I, I put offering in and, and I create my own harvest sometimes because I have my expectation of what God should do for me so I create that harvest credit card loan debt whatever I do and everybody, I'm not saying you should never have debt but we do things to create our own harvest wouldn't you not agree so we create our own harvest sometimes and we wonder why it's not working. And I'm not condemning nobody because we, sometimes there is a place for debt and I have that too. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a, a concept, a spiritual concept. You okay? I'm talking about a place where sometimes we walk in this place. We have this covenant of God. We have this promise of God. But we don't see that promise fulfilled in our life. So we fulfill that promise that we believe that God should have fulfilled. Would you not agree? And so what we do is that we don't know how to harvest sometimes because when we do harvest and when there is not enough, when there's only 30-fold, we expect it 100-fold, we go and try to create that extra 60%. And we try to create that extra percent instead of reseeding or replanting and resowing that 30%, we would have been better off, but we're trying to create 100% when we had 60% or 30%. And so we've got to grab a hold of this covenant that God has for us because we cannot get God and his covenant to change for our purposes. We've got to walk with the covenant of God. We've got to walk with the promises of God. Amen? I want to learn from this. I, I don't want to go in a place where, where I am creating a harvest that's not mine. I don't want to grab a hold of things that is not mine. I'm trying to grab a hold of God's covenant saying, God, if you promise this and you are a God that acts out your promises, why am I acting out on your behalf? That's not a covenant no more. Once I do and not trust the covenant God has put in my eyes, in my place before. It's not a hard word. It's a good word. I think we can all learn. Amen? And so when we walk in God's promises, I want to see His promises acting out in my life. I want to see when He said He died for me and He made a covenant for me and He has grace for me, I want to see it act out in my life. I want to ask God today and I want you to ask with me, Saying, God, how can we act out? How can we walk and allow that promise to act out in our life? How can we walk out and see your covenant blessed in our life? And the only way we can do that is to remove sin in our life. The only way we can see that fullness is this. Is when I have to do something, sometimes there is legit reasons why we do things. I'm not saying that. I'm talking about spiritual concept here. You have to understand spiritual concept. Everybody say spiritual concept. Say, I'm not guilty. If I have debt, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a concept of us grabbing hold of the true promises of God. That's what I'm trying to bring forth, okay? And so we need to remove sin. And what we need to do is we need to grab a hold of what sin is, first of all, so we can remove sin because I don't think all of us really grab a hold of what sin is because we have a sin, a uh, picture of sin that's really not working for us. We need a picture of what sin is so we can remove sin from our life. But we need to remove sin, then covenant will be revealed. What I have seen in life is when I choose to give up something, when I choose to give up the wrong direction or the wrong place in my life, all of a sudden I see God's blessings rise up in my life. I see this happening. I see that happening. I see his promises happening before me. Verse 5 says this. Those are the fathers. Okay, he was just talking here about um, 
before the scripture, he, the, I mean, sorry, he was talking about getting to, to the brothers, bringing the covenant, bringing God's law to them, bringing the place of promises to them. He says, for those are the fathers and womb concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. I love what he says in the next scripture I'm going to talk about here, but God's, he says, this is what the fathers had. This is nothing, never been taken away from you. The promise of Abraham has never been taken away from you. All the fathers before you, all the, all your, everything you ever had, everything God ever blessed before you, it's there forever. It's there forever. Amen. God's blessed forever. It's for all, over all. God blessed forever. And I think we need to grab a hold of that blessing forever that God has for us. Because sometimes we say, why did that person get blessed in the kingdom? Why did that person get blessed in the kingdom when, this is a, when, when that's not meant to be? Or why didn't I get that? But the blessing and the promises are always there. Now this is a, that first scripture, kind of the foundation of what I want to talk about. Now I want to grab a hold of this. Romans chapter 11 27 to 32, and before the scripture, it's talking about the olive tree and how, to be, how you can be rooted into the olive tree, how you can be part of a fruit tree or in the place of grabbing hold of it, uh, being grown or engrafted. He says that I will never leave you because I will always engraft you in again. If you read that chapter, you kind of get the gist of what it's talking about there. It's talking about you will never, ever be left alone. Never, ever be left alone. As much as you fall back, as much as you are crazy, as much as you sin, it don't matter what you do in life, you will always have an opportunity to be engrafted in again into God's kingdom. You will never, ever be left alone. My mercy is upon you no matter what you do. I'm going to be there all the time, every time in Jesus' name. And so when I looked at the tree and I looked at um, how many were here last Sunday, how many were heard the prophecy cluster level? I mean, grapes have clusters, don't they? I was looking at it, and I was watching something. I forgot what I was watching, and I usually don't advertise what I watch, but I was watching something, and something said that a grape alone cannot grow. One cluster cannot grow. One vine alone can't grow. The vine has to be joined together because they feed each other, they fertilize each other, they work with each other. So if you want cluster level, and you want the fullness of cluster level, you have to choose to be part of a vineyard because you can't have cluster level without a vineyard because if you have one plant alone and no other plants, you will not have cluster level in your life. You most likely might not even have grapes. You might not even have fruit. You might just be a nice little green stem sticking out of the ground. And you're going to say, whoo, I feel good in the wind, but that's about all you're going to feel. You're going to feel the power of God. You're going to feel the wind of God, but you're not going to have the cluster level. And remember, on each vine... There's clusters, and that represents church or individuals. And each cluster, we all, like this, she has a cluster. She has people around her that she serves. She has people around her that you are a cluster. But when we join to them together, we have cluster level. Just think about how the vine through the church, she, people say that we are the body of Christ. We are the church as a whole. You're right, we are, but we are joined together as a vine. We're in, we have our individual clusters, and we have our individual places, but all together we have cluster, cluster level. Amen? And so the whole thing about a tree and being and put it in there is that we have to choose to grow in that place. And the biggest thing about the cluster level anointing is that you have to, every year, prune down about 90% of your tree. 90% of you has to be disappeared every year to get the next level of clusters in your life. 90% of your faults, 90% of your character, everything has to be pruned to the level where God can bring you up every year again. This, if you want cluster level anointing, there's going to be something involved here, I'm telling you. There's a covenant God has for you. He has a promise for you. And he says that if you clean yourself up every year and you remove everything that you need, if you walk in that place, you're going to get cluster level. And that tree, after two years, grows beyond your imagination. It can grow. But it only grows together because they're about three to six feet apart. It means that I'm this far apart, but I have the ability to join. I have the ability to vine together. I have the ability to grow together. I have the ability to entwine together. 
When I can, just to put your hand up for a minute, if I go like this, there is a place that feeds this vine, and there's a place that this vine gets fed. Now, when that connects, that connects, that connects, we get it. That's called the covenant of God. That is called cluster-level anointing. That is called when we choose to walk together in the presence of God like never before. And we choose not to be individual vines no more, but we choose to be part of the vine, which is that you are just simply the vine. The power is in the root. So the root is God himself. The God is himself. That is where the power of God is. It is in the root. And when the root joins together, I the root is all together. It joins together as one. The vines is what shines, and the clusters come out of it. And we get the greatness of the grapes and the freshness of God. Amen? We need to, uh, that was all for you too. But we need to be grafted in. Well, either it's an olive tree, there's different seasons and different lives that we are grafting in different things. We sow different things. But one thing we have to understand is that when God makes a covenant, it stands. See, God doesn't reject people. You can read up before verse 27 there. He says, I do not reject my people. If you ever felt rejected by God, you're wrong because God does not reject you. If you ever felt that God forgot about you, you're wrong because he does not reject you. It says in that scripture before that, it says God does not reject his people. He's the root of every person that's here today. The root supports you. The root supports you. Because if the root didn't support you, then when you would be trimmed down, you'd be dead. When you prune yourself, if you didn't have a root, you'd be die instantly. And you couldn't be recreated in that place of newness and what God has for you. Verse 27. For this is my covenant to them, when I shall take away their sins. Everybody say, I. Yes. When this is my covenant, the Lord's, when he shall take away your sin. He shall take away your sin. It's a very important take means this. I will remove, I will carry it, I will cut it off of your life. I will remove that sin. It doesn't make it that hard no more because I don't have to try to remove it myself no more. My, what does sin? I think we need to understand sin so we don't feel guilty here because sin is not just a place of, oh, I did something really bad. This is what sin is. It's without the share. It's I'm going to remove and bring a share into you. I mean, I'm going to bring you partnership with me. I'm going to bring the adoption in with you. That's part of removing sin is becoming part of God. That's removing part of sin. So when he says, I will remove sin, you become part of him. Amen? And then it goes on. It's, it's also sin is missing the mark. It's when you choose to walk somewhere and you choose to walk off the mark that God has for you. So this is a grace, and when you walk out of his grace, that's also considered a sinful nature, is when you choose to not be obedient to what God has for you. Then it's another thing, it's, or to be mistaken, it's sometimes not even willfully done. A sinful nature is not willfully done always. It's being mistaken. It's something that you choose and you walked on a path and find out only later on that you made a mistake in your life. So it's not talking about a condemning word here, though it's something that he wants to remove from your life so you can be blessed in your life. Amen? So it's talking about a place of mistake or, or somebody that has missed or wandered off of the path of God. It's, so sin is, is a place that is used in the Bible as a word where you are not in the fullness of God. You are removed from his presence or something's happening or you wandered off. So sin is sometimes done intentionally in this kind of concept of this word. It's a place of, up, you know, a place of a, where you wander from, up on, from uprighteousness. You wander away from it. Or you, you go the wrong way. Or you wander from the law or that violates God's law. And, or it can just simply mean that you're a sinful man. But the fact is sin, if we remove the sin, if I remove the wrong directions in my life, if I remove the errors from my life, if I remove the mistakes in my life, if I remove those things in my life, that's what God wants to remove. God wants to remove those times where you've done something wrong. God wants to remove when you honestly made a mistake. He wants to remove that from your life so you can flow in the blessing of God. So you don't have to be guilty because he does not reject you. So sin is not something that should reject you. Sin is something that should be removed so you can be fulfilled in the fullness of God. So it's not a place that condemns you. It's not a place that brings you to guilt. But it's a place that brings you closer to God when he removes this stuff. And now you can have the true covenant of God so that when sin gets removed or taken away from you, you are just closer to God. And verse 20 says, As concerning the gospel, 
They are enemies of the, for your sakes. As concerning the gospel, there are enemies for your sake. Did you know there are enemies for your sake? When you choose for the sake of the gospel, when you choose to do the covenant of God, when you choose to walk in the covenant of God, there are enemies assigned there for you, for your sake. Not by God, but there are enemies assigned to you. There are enemies. This says for your enemies for your sakes, but as touching the elect, which means God's chosen ones, they are be beloved for the Father's sake. Amen? But, see, first of all, he, you have to always remember the but. <laughs> Always remember the but. Uh, concerning the gospel, they are the enemies for, um, there are enemies for their sakes. But, thank God, there are enemies, but there's a but in there. There's enemies coming against me, but there's a but in there. The but means that that doesn't have to control me no more. That means that can be zeroed out if I take care of the but. And the word but here is saying, but as touching the election, which means the chosen ones, they are beloved. They are my esteem. They are my dear to me. They're my favorite. They're the, they're, they're the worthy of love. The ones that are worthy of the love. My favorite people that are kingdom of God. My favorite people. It's about my beloved. For the Father's sake. They are for the Father's sake. Verse 29 says, For the gifts and callings, which means callings means invitations of God, are without repentance. He says, But the fact is that you're chosen. The fact is that you're beloved in the Father's eyes. The fact is that you are loved and you're cherished and you're my favorite in my eyes. That's the fact. Don't worry about the attacks. Worry about the fact. Work about the fact that God has for you, that he loves you, and that he is there for you no matter what. He is there for you no matter what. And he walks in that place because he says, for your gifts, for your gifts, which means your talents, which your abilities, the things that you do for God, everything that you are called to do, the grace walk that you have for God, the things that become easy for you, the things that you do for Him, those callings, those invitations of God are, are without repentance. So this word repentance means they, they cannot be repented of. You don't need to repent on who you are. You don't stop repenting. Stop saying sorry of who you are in Christ Jesus. Stop. There is no place. There's no. It's re, it, it, you cannot take that away from you. As much as you want to sometimes, as much as we want to remove that from us sometimes, you can't remove that because there's no chance for it to be removed. You're going to be you no matter if you want to be you. There is no, those gifts are irrevocable. Who you are is who you are in Christ Jesus, and he only wants to multiply that, and he wants to cluster a level of that, but that's who you are. So when we walk in that place, he says, those gifts and callings of God without repentance, there is no regret, basically. There's no regret in that. There's no repentance. It means don't, be re don't have a regret in who you are. Choose to challenge. Choose to uplift who you are. Choose to walk in who you are. Choose to be excited for who you are. Choose to be in a new place of who you are, choose to be blessed in who you are. Those gifts, how many, I believe you have gifts here. How many of you believe? Start walking in them. Start walking in whichever way. Start walking at home and then start doing whatever. I'm not talking spiritual gifts alone here, okay? This gift is a multiple word. This word gifts is talking about the individual of who they're designed to be. This gifts could be talents, could be, could be simple things that you are called to be done, uh, called to do. So there's no, God has, there are without repentance. I love that. Verse 30. For as you in times pa past have not believed. This word not believed means disobedient to God. For times in past you have not believed, you've been disobedient to God. Yet, now obtain mercy through their unbelief. I love this. Here he, Paul comes to talk to these guys says, Yeah, in the past you've been, you didn't believe and you were disobedient in, in God. But guess what? Take the mercy anyway. Take the mercy of God anyway. How many times do you feel like you just haven't done the right thing? And you just want to move forward in that. And you want to move forward in deeper levels in that. He says, don't worry. He says, no, because you haven't taken it, take the mercy, obtain the mercy through their all disobedience. Your disobedience can receive mercy. Through your unbelief, receive the mercy. Through the disobedience that you walked in, choose to start taking the mercy. In spite of the things you've gone through, in spite of the things you've done, choose to take the mercy. Because that's where my power is in. Verse 31, Even so, have these also known not to believe, that through your mercy, they will also obtain mercy. There's people around you 
that don't understand it, but because of your mercy, they will also receive mercy. I love this because I had this one minister once talk, uh, preach in a conference once, and he says, they're flying this plane, and, and this woman beside him is terrified of the plane that's going to crash because she was Googling too much and found out these planes crash easy. And this guy says, you don't have to worry about it. I'm here. I have a purpose. I have a destiny. I have God's mercy on me. You will not die. doesn't matter who you're around. People will obtain your mercy, even the disobedient around you, even the world behind you. If you choose to be part of something, they will receive God's mercy through you. Amen? So this person, this lady, says, you don't worry. I have a purpose. God's mercy is with me. You will not die. And the fact is that when you hang around with the people that carry the mercy of God, you are going to be better off. And there's people around that you walk in that you say, why are they doing what they do? But if you walk there, they can carry and enjoy the mercy that you carry. Amen? It means that we can never be a judge call no more. We can just let, let the mercy flow through us. It says the mercy will also obtain also mercy. Um, verse 32, for God has concluded them all in unbelief that ye might be, have all mercy on all. He says he's, he's concluded to them all in unbelief means that, that they might have mercy. I have, I have not rejected any one of you. You are all part of my covenant if you just take my mercy. If you just take what I have for you, if you just take the ability that I have for you, you're going to have it all. You're going to have the fullness of God in your life, completely in your life. Amen?